Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our live virtual MDA Spinal Muscular Atrophy Symposium. We appreciate all of you joining us today. My name is Nicole Petrowski, and I'm the Community Education Specialist for MDA. We are committed to community education, and we believe in the power of bringing community together for opportunities to learn from specialists and having opportunities to connect with others. This event is part of the larger MDA Engage series with disease-specific symposia, community education seminars, and community webinars as well. This is our final Engage Symposium for 2020. I can't believe the year is almost up for this, but we do have one more webinar on December 3rd that is focusing on care for the caregiver. Please go to mda.org and go to the Family Services tab and register under Engage Events so you can attend if this is of interest. Also, I wanted to reference the SMA webinar we did back in October, um, and we focused on the treatment landscape for SMA. I will share that recording along with the recording from this symposium when it is finalized. We would not be able to put on our educational programs without support of our generous sponsors. I would like to thank Biogen, Cytokinetics, and Genentech for their support of this SMA program. I would also like to thank the representatives who are in attendance today. Now I have a few housekeeping items before we go over and begin our symposium today. As you can see, we have a quite full agenda today. We are recording today's event and we will be posting it to the mda.org website for on-demand viewing in a few weeks. And that will ensure those who weren't able to join us live today are able to access this information. For those of you joining the event live today, please know all, fo all phone lines have been muted. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of each presentation, so please utilize the Q&A icon to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, you will see a tray of webinar icons. Please click on Q&A to open that feature and enter your question to host. You do not need to wait until the presentation is over before submitting your questions. All questions that come up during the presentation, just feel free to send those in. We also encourage participants to communicate with each other by utilizing the chat feature throughout the day. If you wanna just say hi and let participants know where you are from, or if you want to share a bit of your story with others, or if you wanna obtain suggestions from the community, please use that chat feature. Simply click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and make sure you click all panelists and attendees. Attendees is the key so all of the participants can see your comments. And you can use that feature throughout the day. So also, if you look to the agenda that's on your screen, we do have a few minutes in between each session. And please use this to go grab a drink of water or grab something to eat. I will be using that time to be checking the audio and the video for the next presenter. So just so you are aware, you will hear us talking just to make sure the audio is working. And then finally, at the end, I will be sharing a QR code as well as emailing a brief survey at the end of this symposium. And we would like to receive your feedback on what you heard today. We want to make sure we are discussing, discussing topics that are of interest, and we want to use your feedback as a way to improve our future educational events for 2021. So thank you in advance for taking that survey. And with that, I would like to begin our day and present some information on what MDA is about and what it is that we do for our neuromuscular community. We are committed to transforming the lives of people affected by muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases. We are able to honor this commitment by our work in two areas, through innovation and care via our 150 care centers, resource education, and recreational programs, and also our innovation in science with a focus on research, therapies, and technology. We have been doing this work for 70 years. MDA is an umbrella organization supporting over 43 diseases in the neuromuscular disease space. No other nonprofit supports so many neuromuscular diseases. As an umbrella organization, we have the benefit of leveraging key learnings from one disease to inform others. And to learn more about the 43 diseases under our umbrella, please visit mda.org under the About Neuromuscular Disease heading. The MDA has made significant investments in advancing the treatments for neuromuscular disease through our commitment in innovations in science. We are the largest source of funding for neuromuscular disease research outside the federal government, 1.4 billion since our inception. MDA's research is directly linked to approved life-changing therapies across multiple neuromuscular diseases. And we develop a first and only data hub to aggregate healthcare, genetic and patient reported data, 
and help accelerate for future breakthroughs. So as you can see from this screen, we have been on the forefront of research in neuromuscular disease, like I said, since our inception for 70 years. We are at a time of unprecedented change in the neuromuscular disease space with more treatments and development than ever before and rapid growth in the understanding of the mechanism of neuromuscular disease and its treatment. As you can see, we currently have 14 SMA grants and we have committed more than 48 million in SMA research since 1950. Just in the last five years, we have spent nearly 4 million in SMA grants. On this side, slide, you can see the progress that has happened in drug discovery over the past five years in the neuromuscular space. Treatments are now available for periodic paralysis, DMD, SMA, ALS, myasthenia gravis, and LEMS. MDA is proud to have provided funding to many of these treatments along the development process. MDA's MOVER Data Hub, which stands for our Neuromuscular Observational Research, is improving the ability of researcher, researchers and healthcare providers to enhance the care and management of individuals living with neuromuscular disease and to aid the development of clinical trials for promising new treatments. This is done by driving disease understanding, accelerating therapeutic development, and optimizing health outcomes. MOVER collects clinical, genetic, and patient-reported data for multiple neuromuscular diseases to improve health outcomes and accelerate drug development. The diseases include in our MOVER database are DND, ALS, Becker's, Limb Girdle, FSHD, Pompeii, and SMA. There are currently 31 care centers across the country participating in MOVER, with 60 more working on the steps towards participation. Since MOVER is an observational registry, data is available to be collected via telemedicine and phone visits with your neurologist, which is especially important during the pandemic period that we are currently in. If you have questions about participating care centers or the MOVER's data hub, you can email mdamover at mdausa.org or visit the MOVER section on mda.org. Now let's look at MDA's innovations in care, and we will start with our care center network. MDA has the largest network of care centers for neuromuscular disease, providing best-in-class comprehensive care. Our care center ensures a multidisciplinary approach for patient care, which provides patients the opportunity to see multiple clinicians in one visit, allowing for comprehensive coordinated care and helping to reduce the number of trips required to take to the doctor. The care network is made up of over 150 care centers at medical institutions. We have over 2,000 providers working with families at these care centers, and we have over 12,000 individuals are, that are participating in clinical trials. You don't have to navigate your neuromuscular disease journey alone. We are here to help. The MDA Resource Center is available to provide one-on-one -on -one support via phone or email for individuals and families looking for information about the diseases covered under our umbrella. Our Resource Center is staffed by caring professionals some who are living with neuromuscular disease and offer a unique perspective and support to the MDA community. So if you aren't currently visiting one of our MDA care centers and would like to, please reach out to our research resource center for assistance. They provide information on all of these that you see on the screen, um, as well as the care center network, disease information, advocacy efforts, as well as our community programs and education events such as this. The MDA resource staff are available Monday through Friday, nine to five central time, and are typically able to answer your questions within one to two business days. Another great tool that is available at your fingertips is MDA's clinical trial, trial finder guide. This tool provides a comprehensive list of currently enrolling clinical trials in the neuromuscular disease space. The tool will walk you through some of the simple questions to direct you to the appropriate trial that meets the criteria in which you shared. You can locate this tool at mda.org slash clinical trials. MDA also has a myriad of patient and caregiver resources, which are available on mda.org and through contacting the Resource Center. These include the Quest Magazine, which is mailed quarterly, multiple print and online resources, such as teacher's guides, disease-specific information, and so on. And also be sure to stay connected with MDA's blog, which is called Strongly. MDA is dedicated to advocating for national policies and programs that accelerate the development of therapies 
and cures, facilitating early diagnosis and treatment from day one, and ensuring access to critical support and promoting independence. Together with MDA's network of advocates, families, volunteers, and partners, we ensure that the collective voice of our community is heard. Some of the current advocacy issues include accessible air travel, newborn screening, access to genetic testing, patient-focused drug development meetings, increased federal funding for research, and most recently added the MDA Advocacy Institute, which is an educational series featuring monthly webinars that provide advocates with grassroots skills, timely news on issues that are important to the neuromuscular community, and updates from Capitol Hill and federal agencies. To learn more about these and additional initi initiatives, or to sign up and become a grassroots advocate, visit mda.org advocacy. And we will also be hearing from Mark Fisher, who is our advocacy engagement manager here at MDA later today, who will share some important information for you all. And with that information, I would now like to introduce our first presenter for the day, Dr. Marsha Felker. She is an assistant professor of clinical neurology, originally from Chicago. She attended college at Mount Hoylook College in Massachusetts before returning to the Midwest for medical school at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. She did her residency training at Indiana University School of Medicine with residents in pediatrics and child neurology, as well as a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology with special interest in EMG. She directs the Pediatric Neuromuscular Muscular Dystrophy Association Care Center and has a strong interest in neuromuscular diseases. She is the Child Neurology Residency Director and is extensively involved in resident education. She lives in Indianapolis with her husband and four children. So Dr. Felker, welcome today. I will let you go ahead and present your slides. Wonderful, thank you, Nicole. Let me bring up my presentation here. Well, hello, welcome. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I hope to today to present a review of spinal muscular atrophy and talk about some of the best practices in clinical care. Um, uh, if this was the regional conference it was originally intended to be, I'd be welcoming you, welcoming you all to Indianapolis. Um, and though we can't be together today, I hope we can sometime in the future. Um, I was a consultant for Vexus in 2018. And my objectives today are to provide an introduction to spinal muscular atrophy. And I know many of you out there are so very well informed about this disease, so some of this may be old hat to you, which is fine. Um, but I, and then I also hope to review the best practices in clinical care. Okay, so spinal muscular atrophy, what is it? So it's an illness or disorder of the motor neurons that cause, causes weakness. So motor neurons are the cells in our spinal cord that control the movement of our muscles. Our muscles need the nerves to talk to them in order to contract or move. Um, and so here's an example. Um, so this is a cross section of the spinal cord. So if you imagine the spinal cord is a long tube up and down, it's like they took a slice through it and laid it on the table. Um, and so our motor neurons, which are also known as anterior horn cells, live in the anterior horn of the spinal cord here. And then they send extensions, so they're the nerves out to talk to various groups of muscles in our body. So the spinal, mo uh, spinal muscular atrophy is the most common motor neuron disease of childhood. Um, the most common motor neuron disease of adulthood is ALS, which is a disease of motor neurons, but it's a very different disease. Um, and, the mo and SMA is the most common genetic cause of, of, of infancy, excuse me, cause of death in infancy. The symptoms of SMA are primarily progressive weakness. So this causes people to have less movement or no movement. Um, we need muscles to help us breathe. So this causes breathing problems in some people. And then as, um, some, especially with um, the more severe types, can have swallowing problems because swallowing involves the coordination of several different muscles. However, if you have SMA, you have normal feeling, normal sensations. You can tell something's hot or cold or what it feels like, and you have normal intelligence. This disease does not affect the brain and your cognition or cause any kind of intellectual um, disability. The interesting thing about SMA is that we knew about this disease um, well before we ever had any genetic testing for it. So um, when you're talking about SMA, you usually have an interesting concoction of letters and numbers to deal with. So SMA currently is divided on types, um, types one through four, and they are based on the highest motor function that someone achieves. 
Okay, so type one um, is a disease in which um, the weakness comes before a baby would learn to sit. And most babies learn to sit at six months of age. So the sim so this disease starts up before that time and babies never learn to sit and that's type one. If you're a person with SMA who learned to sit but never was able to stand independently, then you have type two and your symptoms likely started somewhere between seven and 18 months of age. If you're a patient with uh, type three, um, then you learn to sit and to stand, but then you may have begin, begun to get weak after that. Um, and then if you're type four, that's actually a very small subset of people. Um, you actually learned to sit and stand and walk and you did very well um, until your second or third de um, decade um, when is, you might have started to have, have the problem slowing down or falling. Um, um, now the type 4 group is interesting because uh, it um, has some people who have the SMA like everyone else that's on the fifth chromosome 5q but it involves also some other diseases that are also motoneuron diseases but have a different genetic origin. Okay, so why does one get spinal muscular atrophy? Now we'll have an excellent talk by our geneticist, Caitlin Payne, later today, but I'm gonna give you just a brief review. So basically, spinal muscular atrophy is caused because you have a problem with um, a gene, often missing or otherwise abnormal, a mutation in the gene for the survival motor neuron um, gene. And that survival motor neuron gene helps motor neurons survive, um, and it makes the survival motor neuron protein. Okay, so just going back to kind of our high school biology, right? So our genes um, are coded in DNA, okay? Um, DNA is transitioned to RNA, um, and then the RNA, the, the cellular machinery in the cell comes through, reads the RNA and makes protein. And our body basically runs on the interactions of many different proteins. So, every, so for most genes in our bodies, we have two copies, but a mom or dad will only pass down one copy in their sperm or their eggs to their child. So what we know about SMA is that it is a disease that's called autosomal recessive, meaning you need to have two copies of that bad gene to have the disease. Um, and we know that it's actually very common that um, the carrier status, meaning if you took a bunch of people in the room, how many are going to have just one copy of that gene? And it's relatively high for SMA, it's one in 54. So it would not be unheard of that two people who are both carriers could decide um, that they want to have children and have and make children together. Um, and so when this happens, um, they have a one in four chance with every time they make a baby to have a baby who, who got one of the abnormal genes from each parent, meaning that they were going to have disease. So we know that spinal muscular atrophy occurs in one in 11,000 live births in the country, which means about 400 to 700 births in the United States each year. So the interesting thing about SMA in humans is that we have two different genes to deal with. Um, the SMN1 gene is a very important gene. It's seen in all measures of animals, even down in yeast. Um, but the SMN2 gene is a protective gene that has developed. Um, so you only see it in humans and then one primate. Okay, so what happens is, so as we talked about, you have DNA, and in the DNA, there are certain important regions called exons. Um, when RNA is made, the stuff in between is taken out, and then you have our mRNA made. And basically, the cellular machinery comes and makes a protein from that. And so when you have an SMN1 gene that's functioning, you make a good level of protein. But if you don't have, S excuse me, if you don't have that, um, then you have a backup gene, the SMN2 gene. Now what happens in the SMN2 gene is that there's a small alteration in it where it only makes a very good protein about 10% of the time. Um, but humans can have anywhere from zero to eight copies of this SMN2 gene. Um, and so if you have eight copies producing about 10% of the good protein, well then you're getting closer to 80%. Um, and so you are very unlikely to have any symptoms of anything because um, you are making so many copies. So we discovered this gene in 1994, and subsequent years, um, we've been able to identify all this important information, which is really helpful for understanding what kind of treatments um, to use to treat this disease um, and to give people a better idea of their prognosis of what's gonna happen in the future. We know um, from very early on, we've known for decades now, that um, the more SMN2 copies you have, the better you are. Um, this was an early study that divided patients into those that had the clinical phenotype, the, the clinical diagnosis of SMA1, 2, or 3. 
And you can see that by far and away, if you have SMA1, it's most likely that you have two SMN2 copies, but there are other possibilities. If you have type 2, you're more likely to have three SMN2 copies. And if you have type uh, 3, then you're probably divided in between either having three or four SMN copies. And this has been duplicated in other studies. This was a more recent study of over 600 patients in Spain. And you can see that um, if you, um, so for two, um, in type 1 SMA, most patients had two copies. In type 2, most had three. And in type 4, they were divided in between um, the three and four copies. Uh, we know that um, your copy number also affects your typical survival. Um, so these are survival charts looking at people who received only supportive care. Um, and so if you have one copy of SMN2, um, then the large majority of people have passed away by one year of age. If you have two copies of SMN2, which is the most typical for when you have SMA type 1, vast majority of people have passed away by 24 months of age and then if you have three copies then it's a little more more variable but average the duration of survival is much longer okay so now we'll break down just a little bit more uh, details about the individual types so type one was discovered by doctors Werdnick and hoffman in the past so that's why they it has the name Werdnick hoffman it is the most common type of sma so if 50 to 60 percent of patients with sma have sma type one and what we teach our medical students about this is that um, patients with SMA type 1 have what we call bright faces. So their smile or their frown can be very strong, their facial muscles work, um, but the rest of their body seems weak. So they have muscle weakness, they have a loosey goosiness that we call hypotonia, um, they can have a bell shaped chest, which I'll show you a picture of, and then they can have what we call bulbar weakness, and those have to do with the muscles with sucking and swallowing. And another feature that you see uh, pretty commonly in SMA1 is something called tongue fasciculations. And so I have a little example here that hopefully will run. So this is clearly not a baby and he's sticking his tongue out, but you can see the little um, tiny movements um, that are reflecting in the light um, <clears throat> of his tongue. And those are tongue fasciculations. So here's some pictures of patients with SMA type 1. Um, so this, the one on the left is a, book that's, or a picture that's been around in textbooks for decades. You might be able to pick out that this baby does have an expressive face, um, but um, he or she looks very weak, right? The arms and the legs are, leg, are, are basically on the bed, and we call this leg posture or frog leg posture. Um, it's likely that this baby <clears throat> cannot swallow safely without swallowing into his lungs, so aspirating. So he has a G-tube. And this is a clunky looking G tube, nowhere near as nice as they are these days. <clears throat> this was able to keep, give the baby nutri nutrition when he wasn't able to swallow it safely. Um, here's a colleague of ours, um, Nancy Bass, who's at Rainbow Babies, um, and one of her patients, who I presume also um, has type 1 based on um, the fact that the baby has a tracheostomy and likely is to have a G tube kind of hidden under that diaper, and the fact that he is a little bit older and he um, certainly has um, some significant weakness here but he has bright faces, right? He's smiling and it looks like they really like each other. Um, SMA2 um, are patients who have learned to sit, but then they have onset of their weakness um, and can lose, of course, that sitting. Um, they may stand with braces, but not by themselves. That's just part of their criteria for SMA2. Um, and it's very common for um, people with SMA2 to have problems with severe scoliosis because of the weakening of the muscles that support the back. Scoliosis is like a bending um, of the spine. Um, patients with SMA2 can also have um, pr a prominent polyminimyoclonus, and that's um, this sort of a tremulous appearance of the fingers. And basically what it is, is, is those are fasciculations of all the little hand muscles, similar to what we saw in the tongue, but it just shows itself up as, as an irregular looking tremor. Um, now, um, the, in terms of when death occurs, if someone with SMA2 is receiving only supportive care, there's actually a wide range in different studies that will say different things. Um, so some people um, have seen um, death in adolescence or young adulthood, um, but there's other studies that have shown that you know, over 70% of people are, are, are still living after age 25 with only supportive care. SMA type 3 is also called kugelberg Weylander disease. And so um, patients with um, SMA type 3, people with SMA type 3, are going to have the widest range of abilities. So all of them are going to learn to walk at some point. Um, but some people will need wheelchairs in childhood. Other people can walk into adulthood. Um, and basically, the later that your symptoms start with SMA3, um, the more strength you are going to have for the long run. And um, 
patients with SMA3 can also have scoliosis, but this is gonna depend on when their disease started. Okay, so how do we diagnose SMA? Um, so it used to be that we, uh, we had to do um, somewhat uncomfortable tests called EMGs or do muscle biopsies, um, but now the standard of care is gonna be genetic testing. And this is from the recent care guidelines that were published in 2018. And it's a little bit busy, but the core of the issue is that you really wanna get testing of SMN1 and SMN2 copy number, um, because that gives us such good information about prognosis. Um, it allows you introduction into trials if possible and it can help dictate what kind of treatments you're eligible for. Okay, now we'll do a, a little bit of a brief review of treatments. Um, so, uh, as, so unfortunately for many, many years, we did not have any um, medications that could change the course of the disease for SMA. Um, but fortunately in um, December of 2016, that changed with nusinersen, otherwise known as Spinraza. So this drug is described as an antisense oligonucleotide, and I'll explain what that means. But in general, it just means that it's going to make the, um, the SMN2 protein, gene, which we know typically would only make good protein that's usable 10% of the time, it's going to increase that number vastly. Um, so it makes much better protein. Um, now this medicine has to get to where the motor neurons are, and it's hard for some medicines to cross what's called the blood-brain barrier. So this is given via a spinal tap, it's, which is known as intrathecal administration, um, about every four months after you get some quick loading doses. Um, if you're on nusinersen, hopefully you're being monitored with blood and urine tests to make sure there's not any side effect from the drug. But in general, it's pretty well tolerated. Um, and then also if you're getting new centers, and hopefully you're being monitored by a physical therapist who's um, watching your motor skills um, so we can see how you were doing. Now, um, there are various motor um, scales that have been used to follow people with SMA so we can see what your progress is. This is, um, the name of this is one of my favorites. This is the Heine. Um, so the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination, the motor um, subset. Um, and so this is something that often your neurologist or PM&R doctor can do in the office, um, evaluating how you progress. And so this is one of a, a common one that we'll use for our patients, uh, for example, who are, have received um, gene therapy. The CHOP Intend is another multi-page um, longer evaluation that physical therapists will usually do because you have to have some equipment and be on a table, et cetera. Um, and uh, they have a subset that was developed specifically for SMA. Um, the importance of these kind of scales, though, is because you really want to have an idea of what the natural history of a disease is. Unfortunately, the SMA community has been so engaged and um, there's been so much good data collected in terms of the natural history. So this, for example, are all infants who received only supportive care um, and looking at what happened to their CHOP and 10 scores over time. With a CHOP and 10, the higher score, the better. Um, and so as expected with SMA, with only supportive care, um, their scores would decline over time. Um, but this information is valuable. So when we have new disease or new treatments, we can say, is it actually changing the natural course, the natural history of the disease or not? Um, so there have been several nusinersen studies that um, have helped um, us um, treat patients. Um, probably the pivotal trial was known as the INDIR trial, um, and this helped get FDA approval. And this was kind of a like, gold star, best kind of research study you could do um, in that neither the patient or the physician knew what the patient was receiving. Um, and they originally intended to get 121 children with SMA to participate but they ended up getting 82 patients and they were randomized. Um, out of three patients, two would get nusinersen and one would get just a sham procedure, so what we call placebo. And what they found um, in, in this interim analysis was that basically patients with nusinersen were just doing fabulously. 40% um, gained motor milestones, which um, is something that would not normally happen in the course of the disease. And these were all patients who were likely thought to have type one. Um, the CHOP Intent um, was another evaluation tool used, and 63% of patients who, who received nusinersen were showing improvement in that, whereas only 3% of people in that sham group, placebo group, were showing any improvement, and far more people in the placebo group were showing worsening of their scores, which would be expected in the natural history of the disease. Um, similarly, they also looked at um, the percentage of patients who needed, um, who either died or needed per, um, permanent ventilation, like a, um, a trach or a ventilator to survive, um, and the patients who received nusinersen did much better. 
Um, so that led to the FDA approval of the drug, um, and those pa patients have continued on in research trials, and they continue to show that they've improved in their motor milestones, so getting stronger and stronger as time goes on. These trials are also important because they've shown us that early treatment has been very critical. Um, so we know that babies with SMA type 1 show severe denervation, and that term means that it shows that their muscles are saying, the nerve talking to me isn't healthy, something's wrong with this relationship. And that is seen in the first three months of life. Um, and other studies have shown that um, infants lose 90% of their motor neurons if they have type 1 by six months of age. Um, and then there's a study in Germany where they were able to see that the patients who started on treatment earlier um, with Nusinersen did far better and were able to achieve better milestones than the patients who started at a later age. Um, so the companies uh, have all followed up um, with different studies, especially looking at children who don't have any symptoms yet, so they're not symptomatic. Um, and the children who received um, Nusinersen, for example, were able to do um, far better with a larger percentage of them learning how to walk over time, and none of them needed permanent ventilation. Now we also have gene therapy, so um, uh, which is otherwise uh, uh, give you, known as Zilgensma, and I'll give you the pronunciation if you haven't figured it out uh, how to say that. Um, it was approved in May of 2019. Um, and this is, rather than um, spinal fluid in injection, this is a one-time IV infusion, so an IV in the arm, for example, um, of an adeno-associated virus number nine. So that's kind of a virus that, in the right circumstances, could give you mild cold symptoms. Um, so what they do is they take um, the shell of, of the virus, and they basically remove most of the important guts of the virus that could make you sick, um, and they put in the SMN gene. Um, so when you receive this infusion, it goes to your cells and to the nucleus, and it actually makes its own um, um, little production center to make the SMN uh, protein. Um, there, there's some barriers, though, to getting this treatment. Some babies are born with um, antibodies to it, showing that their immune system would fight it off if they received this medicine. And so we check what are called antibody titers, and they have to be at a low end or negative before that you can safely receive this drug. You have to have steroids starting the day before you receive it and then for months after to help your body not have an abnormal response to the medicine. And you have to watch your liver clotting factors and some heart enzymes. Um, largely, um, some patients have some liver enzyme risings, but usually nothing um, very critical. There have been some babies who have um, some clotting factors looking a little bit abnormal, but again, no major um, bleeds for the majority of cases. And the heart enzymes are measured because some animal studies showed some problems, but this hasn't largely been an issue for, children, or for, for people. Um, the great thing about gene therapy is that our motor neurons um, don't have turnover. Uh, meaning most of the cells in our body live for a while, um, but then they die and they're replaced with new ones. But those in the central nervous system and our motor neurons do not do that. So those that uh, gene will be there in the, with, with the AAV9 vector producing that um, protein for us forever. But the gene therapy may not last in other cells outside of the spinal cord. Um, so there were several trials that looked at um, how well the gene therapy looked. Uh, worked. Um, and so you can see in these, um, this START trial, they all have very um, cute or cool names. Um, in this START trial, they looked at uh, babies who are most likely to have SMA1 um, and who had symptoms by six months of age and gave them the medicine about six months of age um, and showed definite improvement compared to the natural history of the disease. Um, so 75% of the patients were able to sit, about a third were able to either stand or walk. Um, and then when they've looked at other studies where they treated people at younger periods, so 3.7 months was the average age, um, they had even better numbers. So 91% did not need a ventilator at 18 months of age. 41% um, had what they called an ability to thrive, which was kind of a complicated measure looking at their ability to maintain their weight in a healthy range, their ability to um, feed without any extra tubes, and the ability to take very thin liquids without aspirating or, or being dangerous. And then, miracle upon miracles, we even have a third treatment for SMA, which is just wonderful. So this is Rizdiplam, or otherwise known as Zibrizdi, and this was just approved in August. And so this is an oral um, daily medicine, so a liquid you drink by mouth, um, that functions basically to make the SMN2 protein um, work better, just like it does with Spinraza or Nusnersen. 
Um, and so there's a lot, it's still a new medication and we still have a lot of um, questions about it. But the, th the one of the thoughts is, well, um, we know that that survival motor neuron protein, though it's named for those motor neurons, really is expressed throughout the body. So could this medicine help um, other organ systems that can show some signs of SMA? Um, and in the original studies, um, animal studies for Estiplam, there was a question of some problems with sperm development in early on, but there's been nothing that's been looked at in humans yet, so that's still also an unknown. The Rizoplam studies have the best kind of names. They're all fish studies. Um, and um, so similar to some of the other ones, um, they gave babies um, usually less than six months of age, um, the treatment, um, and uh, one, of the diff one of the difficulties is that in every kind of trial, um, usually there's slight differences in how they measured how well the babies were doing. So there's not any direct comparison between these treatments. But when they examine the babies with a CHOP and TEND, they said that 71% two years in a treatment are basically close to the normal range, and 30% could stand. Um, so really making good progress. And they've checked, um, looked at also patients who are older to get Rizoplan, and uh, are reporting that people are gaining motor milestones, and then also um, independence, which is critical. So now we have all these wonderful treatments for SMA. Um, so um, the other fortunate thing is that we have newborn screening. Um, so that's a, a, a screen done right when the baby is born. Um, it, uh, we started doing that in Indiana, for example, in 2018, and it's now spreading across the country. Um, and this allows pediatricians to find out that their patients um, are you know, screening with a concern for SMA um, anywhere from you know, three to seven days of life, which is wonderful so we can initiate the process of treatment. Okay, with the last few minutes here, um, I wanted to review some of the care guidelines. So these were published in 2018 and they're um, freely available online. You may have to just go to one of the SMA organization sort of websites to um, look for them. Um, but like, um, so SMA is like other, <clears throat> excuse me, complicated diseases that can affect multiple organ systems in which you have to really think about um, multiple aspects of care. And so um, you wanna think about uh, the person who has SMA is the center of the circle with their family helping support them around that. With our care coordinators, and the most important part of our um, MDA care centers, um, supporting them and helping them run the various aspects of their care. Um, so we'll hear from Nikki Hibben, one of our uh, fantastic uh, physical therapists, with more, probably more details. But in general, the care guidelines are broken up to whether or not you are a sitter or a not sitter or if you're a walker. Um, but I can't emphasize the importance of stretching and range of motion exercises um, to help you um, not get contractures or tightness in, um, um, in joints where you can't straighten them out or bend them as you should. Um, we use bracing and various orthotics very commonly, and those have to be used pretty consistently to get good effects. Um, and so the guidelines kind of break down what is important there. Um, um, there's also other aspects of your care, such as um, whatever kind of wheels you have, whether it's a stroller or a power chair, etc. cetera. Um, there's recommendations that they should have the appropriate recline function, which is something insurance companies fuss at, but it's very important to make sure that your um, weight isn't always on one part of your um, bottom or backside. Um, and then they also highlight the importance of other therapies beyond physical and occupational therapy, um, like aquatic therapy or what's called hippotherapy. So horseback riding therapy is known as hippotherapy, which really helps you um, work on strengthening your core. And you wanna make sure that you're getting appropriate evaluations by a physical therapist every six months to make sure um, um, that you're not having developing any contractures or tightness or things that need to be worked on. Another thing to watch for in many types of SMA would be scoliosis, which means a crooked spine. Now, SMA is not the only thing that gives you scoliosis. There's many other th problems that can give you scoliosis, but it can be very prominent in SMA and it can advance quickly. So um, once it's seen clinically, so if someone examines you and sees it, um, then it's usually followed with x-rays. And something called the Cobb angle is measured, which is a way of measuring how much of a bent over that a person has. Um, and basically the guidelines talk about um, monitoring when it's um, um, less than 50 degrees, but if that angle becomes 50 degrees or if it's rapidly progressing to discuss surgery. Um, it's generally preferred that scoliosis surgery occurs after four years of age um, and that you have to take in consideration whether or not a person's done growing when they get scoliosis surgery and the orthop orthopod um, will alter the surgery for that. 
Um, we also know that you can, um, because of that weakness of the muscles, for example, hip instability can be um, seen, um, and then joint contractures can form over time if you're not you know, able to fully straighten out your arm, um, then you might get a contracture if your arm's sort of stuck in a flexed position. And those can cause pain and discomfort. And so we want to try and do all the sort of therapy modalities to avoid that, but sometimes surgery is necessary. Um, and then if there's bone fractures, um, the general trend of care in SMA is going to be a little bit different because the goal is really to get somebody able to move and bear weight um, more quickly than otherwise. And so sometimes there's an increased use of putting rods and fractures in big bones rather than just casting, because in casting you can't move and you might lose a lot of your muscle power. Um, in terms of bone health, we know also that the loss of the survival motor neuron makes your bones thinner and more likely to fracture. And this is probably an effect separate from the fact that, you know, if you can't move as much, then your bones get thinner and that's kind of universal. This is probably an additional effect for SMA. Um, and so patients with SMA should be, um, especially if they're not walking, should be um, monitored with DEXA scans, which are bone density scans that like people, like older women with osteoporosis might get. Um, and then also monitoring vitamin D levels because vitamin D and calcium help keep your bones strong. And some people have to get bisphosphonates, which are like um, heavy duty bone building drugs that usually hormone doctors or endocrinologists help with. Nutritional health is very important with SMA, uh, but there's still a lot of areas in which we need more knowledge. Um, but depending on your type of um, SMA and your um, age, you should have your swallowing closely monitored to make sure you're not having aspiration. Um, we want patients with SMA to minimize fasting. Um, so that means if you're sick, for example, um, we don't want people to go many, many hours without any liquid and without any um, sugar in their system um, because that, um, and so a lot of hospitals have developed, for example, um, uh, care plans if someone with SMA comes in that they're immediately started on fluid or other nutrition. Um, depending on your age, you should also have a dietitian helping follow your diet. It's important not to be too thin, but also not to put on too much weight if possible, um, just to keep um, everything working in as ideal of a fashion as possible. Um, people with SMA unfortunately also have more problems with constipation because they can't move as well. And so making sure you have enough fiber in your diet and that you're monitoring and treating constipation appropriately is very important because let's face it, we're all happy if we're not constipated. Um, we do know that people with SMA are also at higher risk of having cholesterol problems. Um, so um, that's being increasingly encouraged to monitor. Um, and then also in, um, an increased risk of having glucose metabolism problems, so something in the range of diabetes. So that is also recommended to be monitored. Um, and then there's also um, a lot of um, interesting things about abnormal fatty acids. Um, and so some of these things are still unclear. Um, and so I recommend that if you have questions about them, you talk to your doctor. Unfortunately, we are seeing some people who are um, uh, doing diets um, that are popular, but maybe not necessarily the best for your body in the long run. So you wanna make sure you're making safe decisions and talking to people about that. Um, so Dr. Pernik um, will um, join us, or is, has joined us, but he'll talk later about the pulmonary care with SMA. Um, but one of the big um, uh, ideas I wanna make sure everyone's uh, familiar with is that SMA is basically a multi-organ disease, but we're still learning the effects um, to which it affects various organs. Um, but in general, people are starting more and more to monitor for glucose problems and monitor for signs of fatty liver that people with SMA are at a higher risk for. Um, and you know, we already know that it affects the lungs, I'm sorry, the lungs, for example, and not the lung tissue itself, but the supportive uh, muscles for the lungs. Um, it can affect the bones. And, and rarely in some people, they can have heart conditions, especially if you only have one copy of SMN2. Um, so hopefully um, you have access to a care center near you that provides multidisciplinary care. Um, and at Riley Hospital in Indianapolis, we are so lucky to have such a great group. Um, and of course, not all these doctors are um, always um, seen for um, SMA patients, um, but we're really glad we have a, a great team and we can provide um, good care together. Um, so I want to thank you. Um, so first of all, just thank all the families who have pushed for so many years for all this wonderful research in SMA to help develop all these um, wonderful treatments. Um, and then thank you for your time as well today. Thank you, Dr. Falker. Yes. We did have a question that came in. This person says their fiance is 29 years old and has a mix between type 1 SMA and type 2. 
She has movement in her right arm, but she can't move her head or legs without help. Why is she a mix between two types? Hmm, that's interesting. That doesn't happen very often. Maybe we'll save that question to Caitlin Payne later on and see if she can help us with that one. Okay. Okay. Um, and then another one. Is there any medications that can be prescribed orally for SMA? Yes, so the Rizdaplan medicine that just came out in August is the medicine that's indicated um, for patients over two months of age who have SMA. Um, you have to take a liquid every single day, um, but I hear it tastes pretty good like strawberries um, and you have to keep it refrigerated. Um, but that is, that is the newest um, treatment available. Okay, Spinraza is not being done orally yet, is it? No, it is not being done orally. No. Okay. All right. I do not see any other questions that have come through. Thank you very much for your time this morning. You're going to stick around for the drug development table? Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.